Yeah. I think there was a big, you see, there was always a big delusion, I think even during the Cold War. You see, people saw it in ideological terms as a struggle between communism and capitalism. But, I mean, communism was a complicated affair, but I think, especially in Asia, it was only the, the world of nationalism. It was the communists were in, in China, Korea, and Vietnam. They were able to take the lead of the anti-colonial and anti-feudal movement, as opposed to India, where they didn't. But so there was a specificity of that. But basically, for me, these were basically anti-imperialist and anti-feudal movement. And so, for example, the transition between Mao's China and present-day China is not as big as it seems because I think on both sides, on both periods, what they wanted is to develop the country. And somehow during Mao's China, they made the basis of future development by having peace in the country, uh, government control of all, all the areas, and so on and so forth, mm -hmm. and some degree of uh, economic development, and it exploded under the next in the next phase. But somehow the problem of those countries is always uh, reaffirming themselves on the world's keys, uh, world scene, and I think the whole ideological problem of communism was sort of blurring that both on the pro-communist side and the anti-communist side. The country, the main social transformation of the 20th century has been decolonization and the rise of the ex-dominated, the ex-colonies and the ex-dominated countries, mm -hmm. and that is of course the transformation to which we should adapt, but we don't adapt ourselves. And our, our whole ideology of intervention. Uh, blinds us to the necessity of adopting, adapting ourselves to a world which is not dominated by the West, which has, it has been for centuries, but it's no longer and will never be again, and it will be less and less. And that's the main problem of our time. When I speak of non-intervention, I think more broadly, how are we going to live in a world that we don't have all these people working for us at low wages and producing you know, raw materials, etc. This is going to end up eventually, and we'll have to adapt to that. Well, you see, uh, Marx said that communism is well understood self-interest. No, I don't know if that's a, uh, well, of course, he meant communism in his days, not what happened later. But the point is that I think that an ethics based on well, on well understood self-interest is often better than a so-called altruistic uh, mm -hmm. because the altru or called altruistic ethic, because the altruistic ethic may lead to fanaticism, it may lead to blind you to the consequence of your action, it may lead to self-righteousness, you claim to be altruistic and doing all kinds of things for other people, but you don't care about the consequences, like you, nobody cares at what, what's happening in Libya now, or in Mali, and so on, you see, but people feel good, I mean, there's a feel-good policy. I think if you say, look, we, we, are, we have a certain interest we are trying to do, but you have another interest and we are trying to make a deal, that I think is in fact if you recognize that the others have also interests and that their interests are legitimate, because that's the other problem of altruism. You say, oh, I'm altruistic, and all these bad guys, Russia, China, they have interests, but the West is, you know, uh, purely altruistic. I mean, that's a joke. I mean, uh, they are, we are, do have interests, okay? So it would be better to say, look, we have interests, like, like in business. In the end, I am uh, not pro-capitalist, but I think the ethics of saying, you know, we have an interest, you have an interest, now we're going to make a deal, is far better than uh, this sort of, uh, you know, ideology of altruism, but which leads to war, and in the end, because we, we our cause is holy, and you are the bad guys, and so on, that's, that's much worse. The problem is, in the end, you see, well, in the case of the European countries, there is a question of more of dignity than really economic interest because we don't wage very expensive wars. But the United States, certainly in the United States, there is a whole movement, including a conservative movement like Ron Paul and so on, who say, look, we don't get anything from these wars. It costs mm -hmm. us a fortune. It bankrupts our economy and so on. And so we don't want no more wars, okay? But it's interesting that, as opposed to the Vietnam War, uh, there is an opposition to the war both on the left and on the right. And there is a center which regroups people who are very much on the right, in my view, namely the Zionists and the neoconservatives, and the humanitarian left. That's funny. So the, 
the left high divide, the, the thing which is confused in those in nowadays is that the left high divide is I wouldn't say it doesn't exist, but it is not what it used to be, in the sense that there is a very right wing movement and a left movement who are agreeing on interventionism and there is a very right wing movement, a very left wing movement who are against interventionism. And the debate about interventionism mm -hmm. is not the border the left right border. You see? Mm -hmm. Of course uh, sure. that's a problem that the left anti-interventionism and the right anti-interventionism often can't talk to each other because they don't agree on things like gay marriage maybe or on uh, something <laughs> like that. In Europe is a bit different, but it seems to me that the, at least in countries like France, which I know maybe better than other European countries, I mean, except Belgium, but I mean other European countries, mm -hmm. is that there is a, you know, I think there is a deep Gaullist sentiment in, uh, in, the, in the population. But uh, there is no appeal to that Gaullist sentiment which is done by anybody uh, in the sense of saying, you know, France should have its own voice and be autonomous from all the big powers. I mean, the Sarkozy line has been to totally align itself with the United States. But in fact, the pro-intervention left agrees with that. They were all agreeing with the Libyan war, for example. And of course, Sarkozy was not saving the Libyans. Sarkozy was leading the show to a certain point, but of course, in actual fact, it was the United States was waging the war, the most of the cost and most of the bombing and so on, the strategic bombing and the strategic reconnaissance and surveillance and so on, apparatus came from the United States. And so the Fr France was again, like in, in Afghanistan, you know, uh, you know, supporting the United mm -hmm. States, but it was not their own policy in reality. You see, if you are against intervention, then by definition you don't pick sides, sides because... But you see, if being against waging war against a country means that I support that country or that government, then there are two governments that I very much support, the, the other one of Israel and the United States, contrary to what people think. I don't want war with the United States or Israel because they are much too strong. Mm -hmm. So there could be very simple reasons not to go to war with a country. In one would be that you would lose. That the, that's not usually called supporting the country, right? Mm -hmm. So it seems to me that you see it's a constant of war propaganda. Russell was called a pro-German during World War One because he was opposed to war. I mean, it's a constant of because you see once you declare the war, then you have the patriotic feeling. You have all, all to you know get around the flag, and now the flag is the one of human rights. But before it was the nation, it was the country, and so on. I just challenge that. I think there should be alternative to wars, and of course the first way, the first way to start that is to demilitarize, to uh, develop the diplomacy instead of threats and so on. I mean, we're always bullying people everywhere. You see, uh, you see, uh, Mrs. Clinton coming all over the place. What about the country? The United States want this, and the people have the right to this and that. And that. okay, where, 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 where does the authority come from to decide everywhere what has to be done? You see. She claims she has a solution for every problem, from Sri Lanka to Somalia and so on, but that's not true. I mean, let's look at where they intervene and let's look at what the results are. Are they so great? They complain, they say, okay, I don't know whether the figures are high, 10,000 people dead in Syria. Okay, that's tragic. How many people dead in, in, in Iraq compared to that? Far more, hundreds of thousands probably. And how many refugees? So that's a result of intervention. So you have to give me an argument that intervention is better than non-intervention. And calling it support. I mean, you see, it's also funny because they trade with these countries, they trade militarily with those countries, like Libya, Syria, and so on, at some point, or Iraq, and so on. They, the governments who then wage war, and when they wage war, they call the pacifists or the anti-interventionists, they call them supporting the government. I never supported this government because I have no means to support them. I have no weapons, I have no money, etc. They do it. They sell weapons during the Iraq-Iraq war, the Iran-Iraq war, they sell weapons to Iraq, and then suddenly, People who are against unilateral wars are called supporting those governments. Mm -hmm. It's ridiculous. It's simply ridiculous. We just challenge every... I mean, I think I'm for challenging every assumption, in hidden assumption in the, the pro-war discourse. Mm -hmm.